Thy will be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And Holy Father God, we approach your throne of grace humbly and we praise you and we thank you for your grace your mercy and your love towards such wretched people as we are and uh, Holy Father God we praise you and we thank you for your Holy Son the Lord Jesus Christ which uh, this your servant and prophet Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did glorify in this message, in this sermon. We praise you and we thank you for your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word and for all of the millions and manifold blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We praise you and we thank you for salvation and spiritual family and life, mental and physical, protection and provision, financial and material blessings that you bestowed upon us down through the years, not only for today, but since we have been on earth when we didn't even know our name. And Holy Father God, thank you for bringing us a mighty long way as the song we just heard talks about. And Lord, help us to indeed stay on the battlefield for our Lord until the day we die. And Holy Father God, we individually and hopefully collectively truly confess our sins, our failures, and our faults unto you. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive us of our sins. As we from our hearts, by your grace, forgive those who have sinned against us. We acknowledge our nothingness without you. We acknowledge our weakness without you. We thank you for your whole holy word that reminds us that it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd wash and cleanse our souls and spirits and consciences and hearts and minds of anything that's not like you, of all sin and all unrighteousness, of word, thought, and deed. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Lord, where we have grieved your Holy Spirit or quenched your Holy Spirit in any way, help each and every one of us to be honest about it and to confess our sins and to make things right. Uh, with you and others, make us whiter than snow on the inside. Cleanse us through the precious blood of Christ. Crush and crucify our flesh and the old man within us, afresh and anew this evening, and fill us all afresh and anew with the fullness and the power, <clears throat> the unction and the anointing, the fruit and the liberty of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on this Friday night, representing Good Friday, which will be mentioned in this message, the devil hates Friday. Uh, the devil hates Saturday and the devil hates Sunday, especially these three days. And so we know that He's going to raise his ugly head. We know that he's going to attack. We know that he's going to try to cause a problem. Problem. So, Lord, help us, your little saints, to pray without ceasing 
Help us, Lord, your little saints, to be sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful, and prayerful, and on point. Help us to be alert. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to keep our hearts and minds stayed on you, and help us to keep an eye on that devil in the corner who will pounce as soon as he sees the weakest link and try to hinder, try to cause a problem during the service or after the service. Lord, I thank you for what I have witnessed this evening, how our staff did some things uh, this evening that... uh, 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 they have uh, they rarely do and Lord I don't know who the leader was but I am very thankful to you that you led them to do uh, something magnificent this evening in preparation for this service and so Lord I continue to pray for them and I do pray that you would cast out the devil and the demons of hell and the satanic demonic spirit of Judas betrayal and the spirit of Sanballat the spirit of Jezebel the spirit of Tobias the spirit of hindrance, the spirit of distraction, the spirit of treachery, the spirit of sabotage and uh, betrayal. Lord, it is real and healthy, unfortunately, in the world, uh, not only here, but in all families that stand for you, all ministries that stand for you, all churches that stand for you, the demonic spirit of Judas, the pharaohistic, prideful spirit, which is a devilish spirit, the spirit of the devil, stubbornness, rebelliousness, meanness, selfishness, all balled up into one, is still in the world, in families and in churches and in ministries. We have, unfortunately, as Dr. King is going to bring out tonight, have been engaged in this happy talk Christianity, uh, this uh, prosperity garbage uh, Christianity, which does not tell the truth. It always wants to put on and make like everything is hunkadory and wonderful, and it's just not the case. Right now, uh, well-known, several well-known pastors and their families are in the news so sadly because things are not perfect as they have put on. Things are not great and wonderful and hunkadory and uh, they're not necessarily the head and not the tail. And it's so tragic Uh, They could be, if they did not buy into a false teaching and false doctrine taught by false prophets, uh, that the Christian is not supposed to have any problems or health problems, and if they do, they just don't have faith, or there's some kind of sin in their lives, and Lord, you know that's not true, because you had no place to lay your head. You never committed one sin, but they beat you and scorned you and humiliated you beyond recognition before the world. Who would even think of putting, plaiting together a crown of thorns? Uh, That has to be from hell. To place already on your bleeding crown, your bleeding head, 
you were bleeding from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet for wicked, evil, ungodly people who were doing that to you and for us. So, Lord, your gospel, your true gospel is quite different from the gospel that these false prophets and teachers have made it into. And Dr. King knew better back in his day. Sad to say they had better sense than so many of us living today with this false foolishness. And uh, Holy Father God, we pray, open the eyes of the blind in the church and uh, Lord, help them to recover from the snare of the devil and help us to learn how to live in this life of tension and particularly to bring it home uh, today in this time of the plague, the pain and wicked politics. And so Holy Father God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would rebuke and bind the devil, his demons, and his hosts, Lord, from us now and throughout this night and throughout this weekend. And Lord, I can feel the tension and the heat that he brings already. And it is a battle, and we don't like to battle, sad to say. And so, Holy Father God, I do pray that you would deliver each and every one of us tonight who is saved from temptation, evil, and sin. Grant us your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to love right, to live right, to think right, to do right, to act right, and to do that which is pleasing in your sight. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Lord, I pray that you'll help us tonight to humble ourselves and to pray and to seek your face and to turn from our wicked ways and to repent and to get back to you our first love and Lord I do pray that you would save those who are lost here and in this city in this country and around the globe Revive those who are saved here and in this city, in this country, and around the globe. And Lord, heal those who are sick according to your will in this city, in this state, in this country, and around the globe. If they are your children, help them to call, help them, be, help them to be obedient and call for the elders of the church, but also help them to confess their sins and to divulge the ugliness of their sins and to be transparent so that they can be healed and raised up. Lord, I know you can do it. Lord, you've done it for many. And I thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And uh, Holy Father God, we pray that you would, uh, we pray for those who are grieving and mourning tonight. Over 4,000 again dead by the coronavirus plague, I believe yesterday. Maybe the same amount or more tonight. Dying each day in this country called America. Comfort the families that are hurting uh, extremely, uh, hurting very much so. And Lord, uh, uh, comfort them, save those who are lost and comfort them, draw them to yourself for salvation and comfort. And Holy Father God, Demonstrate the power of your Holy Spirit in every way, here and there. Let your will be done, and not ours. 
And Holy Father God, for those of us who are still standing and have not been impacted by the coronavirus plague, help us not to get the big head. It's only by your grace that we are still standing. And help us, Lord, to be humble, sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful. And uh, help us to be thankful. And, uh, Lord, prepare us for good days and bad days. Prepare us, Lord, for... uh, days of celebration and tragedy. Prepare us, Lord, for weddings and funerals. Prepare our families, Lord, for life and death. And Lord, we will hear some of that from Dr. King tonight as well in this message. For not only, Lord, did you have to give uh, a gift of oratory to this preacher that is unmatched. Uh, Lord, uh, he had substance as well. And many of us do not know that, but he, he did. And so, Holy Father God, help us to hear the message that he preached long ago in an adapted form for our time tonight. Open blinded eyes and stop deaf ears. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would deliver us from all of our, if we do right by you, if we confess our sins and repent on a personal basis, on an individual basis, a family basis. Lord, deliver us from our tribulations and our troubles, our trials, our temptations, our tests, and our tensions. And Holy Father God, I pray uh, tonight that you would bless and protect our family and our ministry and our church. Bless and protect all other true Christian families and true ministries and true churches across the country and around the globe from ourselves, from our flesh, and from uh, the devil. Lord, help all of us to tell the truth and shame the devil and stop living a lie, being hypocrites and phonies and fakes. Lord, help us to be real about it because you're real about it. And Holy Father God, I do pray that you will also protect us, Lord, from the demons of hell and from evil people in our families, evil people in the church, evil people in the world. Place, Lord, upon us the whole arm of God. Surround us with your protection, a band of your holy angels and a wall of your holy fire. Save those who are lost. Revive those who are saved. We cast all of our, those of us who are truly saved and we're at peace and content. As Dr. King will bring out in the message again, uh, Lord, tonight, those of us who are at peace and content. And we have taken Jesus up on his wonderful offer. Lord, I, we pray that, uh, Lord, we who are that way, we cast all of our burdens and cares upon you. For, Lord, we know that you care for us. Fill us with your peace that pass of all understanding, your joy unspeakable, your holy serenity and tranquility of mind and heart. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and forsake. Amen. You may be seated. living under the tensions of the plague, pain, and 
wicked politics. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last message in this series, we looked at the tensions that grow out of the struggle to make a living in this world and particularly during the time of a plague and pain in every way. and uh, wicked politics. In a day and time where we not only have a plague bearing down on us, worse than any hurricane or tornado, then the pain of losing loved ones and not only one at a time in a family, but two and three and four and five and six and seven. There's a NBA basketball player right now. He has the coronavirus and he's already lost seven family members. Living and as a, living under tension and as a result of humanity facing the fact that we will die one day. And the truth of the matter is the way things are going, that one day could be very soon. Because contrary to the fact that we have a new president Contrary to the happy talk, and uh, this is good news talk that we hear from politicians and uh, medical officers, the plague is not going to end until we the people repent, first in the church and then in the world, and that includes the government. In the midst of this tension, however, we are directed towards the light of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can find peace in the midst of the tension. I do hope tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that in the midst of the tension of the plague, the awful pain, and uh, the foolish politics that we have to deal with and endure, that you have peace in the midst of the tension. In the midst of all of that, a voice rings out, Dr. King says, through all of the generations saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll and I will give you rest. That voice cries out to us, saying, Come unto me, all ye that are laboring every day, trying to make ends meet, trying to make a living trying just to get by, trying to get just one more meal. Uh, intermittent fasting is very popular today, but some of us have had, have had to go to that uh, by, because of uh, necessity, the one meal a day diet. You're caught in this round of life, Dr. King said. You're caught in this round of life, in this chain of life, 
all of those who are laboring, trying to explain this thing called life, all of those who are laboring under all of the pressures and problems of life, those who are heavy laden with burdens of despair and depression and care and worry, those who are laden with fear, those who are laden with anxieties and disappointment, come unto me and I will give you rest, says Jesus Christ. the Lord of glory, the Prince of Peace. That's the voice that comes crying out to modern life. That's the voice that comes crying out in this plague, in this season of awful pain and crazy politics which gives us a little solace to carry us on a little ways. And if we didn't hear that voice, we couldn't make it. That voice simply says to us that the answer to the tension of modern life The answer to the tension of our present plague, pandemic, pain, and politics is to sufficiently commit ourselves to Jesus Christ and to be sure that we have truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and received Christ as our Savior. For until a man comes to faith in Christ, he lives life in eternal frustration and he finds himself crying out unconsciously with Shakespeare's Macbeth that life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Until he gets some religion. Now, you must understand back in those days when Dr. King was preaching this message, religion had uh, a good reputation, the word religion. Not so much today. But so when when Dr. King used the word religion, it meant something. It meant trusting Christ as Savior. It meant getting saved. It meant getting baptized. It meant going to church and uh, seeing your life turned around. He was talking about the old time religion which many of us, we don't have today. So this is a good word. That's what he's referring to here. It was okay to get some religion back in those days because they knew what it meant. It meant to trust in Christ and to be saved and to start doing what the Lord wants you to do. If he does not have the Lord, he cannot stand up amid the tensions of modern life. Dr. King said that is why H.G. Wells can cry out and say that a man who is not religious begins at nowhere and ends at nothing. For religion is like a mighty wind that knocks down doors and breaks down walls and makes that possible and even easy, which seems difficult and impossible. 
it is religion or faith in Christ. It is a proper religious faith that is the answer to the tensions of modern life and it is the answer to our present predicament, the plague, the pain, and the disappointment of politics. Dr. King said, I have a statement here from a man you should know, the great psychiatrist Jung, Jung, who was greatly influenced by Sigmund Freud, but who went a little beyond Freud, but most of his life spent had been spent counseling people who have confronted the problems of life, the agony of modern life. And this is what Jung says. He says, during the past 30 years, people from all the civilized countries of the earth have consulted me. I have treated many hundreds of patients, the larger number being Protestants, the smaller number Jews, and not more than five or six believing Catholics. Among all my patients, Dr. King said here in this message, using this psychiatrist to make his point, in the second half of life, that is to say over 35 years of age, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. Now, mind you, again, The word religion was a good word back then, not so much today. And and what they're referring to is believing in Christ. They're not talking about Buddha here. And and, and getting baptized and, uh, and seeing your life changed by God. Now, Dr. King said, now, now, that's not a preacher talking. That's a psychiatrist talking. That's a psychoanalyst talking. He's saying, in substance, that people faced, people face, rather, the frustrations and bewildering experiences in life so often because they do not have the proper religious bent on life. They do not have faith in God and in Christ. So the experiences of life come before them as mighty winds and knock them down because they have nothing within to face them. I think Dr. King is talking to some folks living today. He said, facing the tensions of modern life through the proper religious faith, and that is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is saying here. Come unto me. Sufficiently commit yourself to me and you will make it. Now, what does faith give us? What does religion give us? What does genuine faith in Christ, genuine religion give us? What is it that Christ gives us to help us face the tensions of modern life and make it through the plague and the pain and failed politics. What is it? And stand up amid the tensions of life. 
What is it that he gives us to keep us going when it is hard to go on? What is it that genuine faith in Christ, genuine religion has to offer for us to live the difficult reign of life? Dr. King said, I think the first thing is that Faith gives us a capacity to accept ourselves. Here's Dr. King who, yes, was gifted with extraordinary uh, gifts as far as oratory. But he was a man of substance as well. Now, here's Dr. King, the pastor, and he says, and I think that is one of the first lessons that all of us should learn. And this is, by the way, a, 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 a lesson that he taught not only in this sermon, but in other sermons. He taught it to young people uh, in high school auditoriums. He did. It's a powerful lesson as well. And it was uh, very apropos during that time when blacks were trodden down and beat down. And he knew it. And that is the principle of self-acceptance. I, I, I thought about this and I remember him talking about this in another sermon he preached to some uh, young people. This was very heavy on his heart because he saw how black folk, and I remember when we used to do this, buy some Ambi, I guess they called it, or Clorox trying to lighten our skin. He even addressed this to the young people. How many of you remember those days? God help us. Some people are still doing it today. Walking around with a half white face and a black neck. That's how we looked back in those days. Trying to have lighter skin. Trying to have good hair. Dr. King said in another message, my hair is good. You don't have to put uh, stuff in your hair to try to look white. This was heavy on his heart, and this was very important during that time. He tried to lift black folk up to accept themselves. And sad to say, ladies and gentlemen, this message is more needed today than ever before. Now we have not only white folks, but black folks. Not only black folks, but white folks. White folks trying to be black. Black folks trying to still be white. Millions, billions of dollars <clears throat> are spent on fake hair, horse hair, Korean hair, Indian hair. Koreans move over here and start uh, hair salons and things and, 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 and put their hair in black folks' hair and, and people got all kind, everybody's hair in their head today. You've heard me talk about this. It's worse now than it was back in Dr. King's day. I would venture to say that over half the nation is not themselves. <laughs> They're fake on the outside and no doubt on the inside. Fake hair, fake eyes, fake nose, fake chin. Have you ever seen these people who 
They try to smile in lines form on both sides of their mouth. Botox. Don't get mad at me. I'm, I'm bouncing from Dr. King. He's, he's already up in heaven. Fake behinds. Fake breasts. If Dr. King was here, he would tell you to accept yourself as God made you. He would. I'm trying to tell you, but you're not hearing me. Everybody got some fake stuff on, got men putting on fake stuff. Going to the plastic surgery man, getting Botox, making yourself look deformed. And Dr. King goes on to say, this accounts for one of the big problems in modern life. So many people have been plunged across the abyss of emotional fatalism because they did not learn this simple lesson, the lesson of self-acceptance. That's what's wrong with many people today, by the way. Dr. King goes on to say, so many of us hide this tragic gap between our desired self and our actual self. That's what we have going on today. We find ourselves living life trying to be what we are not and what we can't be. And I believe this is the case, ladies and gentlemen, for millions of people. So many people had parents who did not have the wisdom to tell their children, you have limits. No, you cannot be everything you want to be. You can be what God wants you to be. But you don't have endless gifts and talents. You need to be the best you that God made you to be. Dr. King goes on to say, so, so genuine faith in Christ, in God, genuine religion says to us, in no uncertain terms, accept yourself. You cannot be anybody else. You can't be me and I can't be you. And your great prayer in life should be, Lord, help me to accept my tools. That is my talents, my abilities, my gifts. However dull they are, help me to accept them. And then, Lord, after I have accepted my tools, my gifts and talents and abilities, then help me to set out and do what I can do with what you have given to me. For there is a bit of, tal of latent and I love that word latent. For there is a bit of latent creativity within all of us seeking to break forth. And that creativity is often blocked because we are trying to be somebody else. Trying to be what we aren't. There is nothing more tragic. There is nothing more tragic than to see an individual whose ambitions outdistance his capacity. Now that's, that's 
poetic, but so powerfully true. And it is sad. Have you ever seen it? People who have ambitions that they really can never reach because they don't have the capacity for it. That's a tragic sight, Dr. King said. Trying to be somebody that you're not. Humble yourself down and accept the way God made you and be the best you you can be. So that we have in life this responsibility to be sure that we are willing to face our capacities as they are and do the best we can with them. And that's all God requires of us. That's all that stands before you is to do it well. And when you stand before the judgment of all eternity, there is a great reward. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been good, faithful over a few things. Come up high and I'll make you ruler over many things. That is true for the two talent man as well as the five talent man and it would have been true of the one talent man if he had used it. We must live by this principle of self-acceptance. Dr. King said, oh, I know a lot of things in life that I would like to have and I just have to face the fact that I don't have them and live by it. That means accepting everything, even your looks. Dr. King said, I wish the Lord had made me tall, tan, and handsome, and it would have been much better for my sake. I would have enjoyed uh, that the mirror would have been much more meaningful to me. But I can't spend all of my life worrying because the Lord didn't make me that way. We must come with that bit of humor to see that we must accept ourselves as we are. That becomes the first lesson of life and genuine faith in God, genuine religion gives us that so that we rise above the competitive tension of life because we accept ourselves as we are and we begin to say like Moses said in green pastures, Lord, I ain't much but I's all I got. And we live by that principle and you live through life with a harmony that men all around you can never understand because you learned a great secret to life. The secret and the principle of self-acceptance. But not only that, Faith in God, high, genuine religion, gives you the capacity to accept the realities of life. Not only yourself, but the external circumstances that beat up against you in life. The plague, the pain, and disappointing politics all around. That is one of the things that makes also for a lot of problems of modern life. That so many people have not mastered this art of accepting life as it is in a balanced perspective.
we must come to see that life is a pendulum swinging between two opposites. A pendulum swinging between disappointment and fulfillment. Between success and failure. Between joy and sorrow. And that's life. And we never mask the life. And we think that life must be only joyous and happy. And that we must live in terms of fulfillment always. Disappointment is just as much a part of life as fulfillment. Failure is just as much a part of life as success. Sorrow is as much a part of life as joy. That is the thing that faith helps us to see. That is the thing that true religion helps us to see. That is the greatness of Jesus Christ. And he goes one day out standing amid the good Friday night and the good Friday's light. He knows that good Friday is as much a part of life as Easter. And life somehow is a pendulum swinging between good Friday and Easter. Swinging between agony and triumph. Swinging between darkness and light. And he who learns that. And he who learns that has learned the lesson of life. So that he doesn't break down when he faces the other side of the pendulum. When the bitter moment of life comes. He doesn't break down, nor does he get overjoyous when the sweet moments of life come. Because he knows that this is the endless trend of life. This is the way it moves. This is what carries life on, the pendulum. Why it is that way may be we do not fully understand, but it is. True faith says, true religion says, yes, there is a crown you wear, but before the crown you wear, there is a cross you must bear. We learned that when we learned to live close to Jesus Christ, and we go unto Christ, our Savior. He gives us the rest that comes for learning from learning this lesson that life is a pendulum and it can throw us around and throw us wild when we let it. But one day, one day we might be rich and that doesn't bother us. One day we might be poor, and that doesn't bother us. One day we might be happy, and that doesn't particularly bother us. And one day we might be unhappy, and that doesn't particularly bother us. Because we know that life is going to swing right back to the other opposite. We learned that and we learned then to live with a harmony, with an inner peace that the world can't understand. That is why Jesus Christ says, my peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth. The world can't understand this peace, for it is an inner peace. It is a tranquil soul amid the external accidents of circumstance. Christ gives us that. If we will only come unto him, 
He gives us the capacity to accept the opposites of life. Not only that, faith at its best, genuine religion at its best, and when we go unto Christ, we discover this, that there is something called forgiveness for the sins we commit. That too is a great release, isn't it? To get forgiveness of our sins. That is another lesson that we must all learn if we are to live amid the tensions of modern life and if we're going to live under the tensions of the plague, the pain, and disappointing politics. My question for you now, dear friend, is do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have faith in Christ? Have you received the forgiveness of your sins through belief in Christ? Do you have that old time religion? I think we'll, we'll play that out as our outro, given that old time religion. Now, dear friend, if you are with us tonight and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation from the power of sin, from the pain of sin, and from the punishment of sin in that awful place called hell. Move over here. First, dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law, and so have I. The Holy Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have sinned, haven't we? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen something from somebody? Have you ever coveted or lusted after somebody or something? Have you ever dishonored or disobeyed your parents? Have you ever dishonored God by taking his holy name in vain. I just mentioned the breaking of five of God's commandments. And I would venture to say that you and I, we've broken all of those in our lifetime. And since that is established, secondly, accept the fact, dear friend, that there is a penalty, there is a punishment for our sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23a, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We die because of our sin. We don't die because of cancer. We don't die because of heart attacks. We don't die because of the coronavirus. We die because of our sin, our sinful nature, and our sinful choices. Our bodies, therefore, go to a grave. Our soul goes to that awful place called hell if we have not truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and repented of our sins. And hell is a very real place. Hell is not a figment of your imagination. Hell is not a joke. Hell is serious. Hell is sad. Hell is bad. And hell is bad news. 
Jesus Christ preached more on hell than any prophet, any preacher, any apostle, or any writer in the Bible. Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did about heaven. One time in describing hell, he said hell is a uh, place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is an awful place. At another time, he said, Hell is a place where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And then in this sermon he preached on hell, he said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Most times when Jesus Christ preached on hell, he mentioned the everlasting fire. Hell is a very real place, dear friend. And you are on the road to hell if you have never truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving, a soul-saving sense. Hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you. You don't have to go to hell if you don't want to. Jesus Christ said the most loving, yes, Jesus Christ was a hell fire and brimstone preacher. But he said the most loving, most wonderful, most magnificent words ever said to humankind in the history of the world when he said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is how you get that old-time religion. This is how you get the kind of faith uh, and peace and joy that Jesus is offering to you in the midst of the tensions of life by simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how simple it is to get this salvation and to get these blessings that he's offering to you. The Bible says, whosoever, Jesus Christ said, whosoever, that word whosoever means anybody at any time in the history of the world. Red, yellow, black, or white, we're all precious in God's sight. We may not be precious in each other's sight, but we're all precious in God's sight. And then notice the next word, whosoever believeth in him. Believeth in him. The word believeth means to trust in, to have faith in. And as soon as you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he changes your destination from the prison house of hell to the peace house of heaven. You don't have to perish in hell forever. In the everlasting fire, you can have everlasting life with God, with Jesus, with the angels and the people of God forever in heaven by simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou, you, shall be saved. Dear friend, if you're ready to do that, I'm ready to lead you in prayer for the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 
and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou you shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. Are you willing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is up to you. God won't make you and I can't make you. This is for your own good. I did it December the 19th, 1979. Tonight could be your night. And if you're willing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, many, many people have done this right from this pulpit and have followed me in prayer in praying the sinner's prayer. You can do it right where you are. You don't have to. You heard what Jesus Christ said. Believe in me. Whoever you might be. And I will save you. From hell to heaven. It is as simple as that. You don't have to be in a church building. To get saved. You don't have to be a member of a church to get saved. You don't have to get baptized to get saved. You don't have to shout and speak in tongues and run around the church to get saved. All you have to do is believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose on the third day by the power of God. Call on his name. Let him know you want him to be the Lord and Savior of your life and ask him to save your soul and he will. Follow me in prayer right now as we pray the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me if you're believing in your heart in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Let's pray. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I admit, Lord, that I have sinned against you. In fact, Lord, I have committed uh, the sins that the preacher talked about earlier. And as you know, I've committed many other sins. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon my soul. And please forgive me of all of my sins, my failures and my faults. As I now believe with all of my heart in you, Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that you suffered, bled, and died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day by the power of God. Lord Jesus Christ, please come into my heart and into my spirit and save my soul tonight. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to truly repent of all of my sins. And help me to turn from my evil life to follow you in the new life, Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I do pray, amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believed in your heart that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose on the third day that he paid your sin debt, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life. 
and that is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my book titled, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And dear friend, if you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, please email me at dw3 at gospellightsociety.com and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send to you. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well, and we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good is my prayer. If the Lord tarries his coming and we live, uh, we will be here tomorrow morning uh, around 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, uh, and 8 o'clock Pacific. Uh, and so if you have a prayer list, please put us on your prayer list and uh, pray for yourselves. Pray without ceasing. And... Uh, Pray always. Pray for your family. Keep your heart and mind stayed on the Lord. Make sure you walk with the Lord so that you can endure the tensions of modern life and of times under the plague, the pain, and disappointing politics. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time, let's all stand for our closing prayer. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for what you have done, for what you're doing, and for what you will do. We give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for the many souls that have been saved from a simple meeting like this down through the years. Lord, if I do not meet all of them down here, I look forward to meeting them on Hallelujah Boulevard, if you will, Lord, up there. And we'll have a wonderful, wonderful time in you. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Help us all to be sober-minded, vigilant, watchful, and prayerful throughout this evening. Help us to pray without ceasing. Help us to keep our hearts and minds stayed on you. Keep us, therefore, in perfect peace. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion is good enough for me. It was, was good for the other others, it was good for our mothers, it was good for our mothers, it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion.